William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Give a man enough rope and he'll hang himself. An old proverb, but don't believe it too implicitly. Give a man enough rope and he might hang you. A switch, but all in the line of work. After all, a hangman also is. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Craig speaking. There's nothing like a college education. The hallowed halls of Ivy is the perfect cure for moss on the brain. I had my own wits nicely sharpened a case or two ago, matriculating in an institution of higher learning known across the land as Blankhurst U. I've been summoned to the dean's office. A mild-looking chap with eyeglasses that sat on the middle of his nose. His name was Palmer. Dean Percival Palmer. My decision to employ you is personal. As you may know, we uh, have a rather celebrated uh, basketball team. Enough said. I can fill in the rest. A rated basketball team grown too big for the old college gym. Gone big time. Big arenas. Big gates. Big dough. Big bet. Players are bribed. Games are dumped. Etc. and so forth. I've considered outlawing uh, basketball at Blankhurst U. Now, what are the facts? There are no facts as such. Only whisperings, grave rumors, a seething undercurrent in the school and in the public press. Well, spell out one specific rumor. Very well. It is hinted that the contest of last week was, uh, well, uh, fixed. Who played against Blankhurst U last week? Stratton College. Stratton College was the obviously inferior team. Well, obvious by what measurement? Why, its record for the season. It had won but two contests and lost 14. Hmm. Pretty feeble, all right. While Blankhurst U came into the contest with 16 victories and three defeats. Making Blankhurst U the odds-on favorite. But uh, Blankhurst U lost, huh? Yes. Well, how close was the score? 49 to 43. There was a sharp newspaper attack after the contest. A sports columnist named Sophie Slater writes a column called The Lowdown on Sports. He was almost libelous in what he wrote. Well, uh, who is the captain of the team? Chris Ransom. And who is the coach? Sandy Bigelow. Do the rumors touch Coach Bigelow? Very much so. The crooked coach, rare if true... It's usually one player that louses up a team, one susceptible sucker that gamblers can get to. However, uh, when's the next game? Tomorrow night, Blankhurst, you plays Van Burson College. Well, uh, who's favored to win? Van Burson College has yet to win one major contest this season. Meaning if Van Burson wins tomorrow, there's really something rotten in Blankhurst. The next night, I was a spectator, uh, along with 20,000 other basketball fans. The game was played in the million-dollar Bates Coliseum. Everybody invited, regardless of pedigree, nobody barred. Just pay the admission tab. Look over your shoulder and see half the graduating class of Sing Sing, 1935 to 55. College basketball was sure rubbing elbows with riffraff. Blankhurst figured to be a walkaway winner on its record. Only it wasn't. It was trailing in the last quarter, 67 to Van Bursen, 74. Trailing with only minutes left on the big clock. And then the final whistle blew. The cat calls and boos could be heard in Siam. If Blankhurst had lost legitimately, nobody but nobody believed it. I caught the captain of the team, Chris Ransom, under the showers. 
a gangling youngster who stood six feet six high. Red hair and a crew cut. And freckles like somebody had spotted his face with a ripe tomato. Hey, pass me a towel, huh? Sure, sure. Here you are. Uh, thanks. You're here to help with me, huh? Well, why do you say that? You're the secret agent Dean Palmer wished on us. Well, I see my fame has preceded me. Oh, well, whenever you're ready, Chris, I've got some questions. Well, is this going to take long? I've got a date. New chick. I can lose her to 20 other guys. Well, I'll make it brief. Well, I'm holding you to that. Come on, we can chin in the locker room. Captain Chris Ransom wasn't too candid a witness. So we lost a few games. Why all the hullabaloo? Well, Blankhurst lost two in a row to pushovers. The team's on ragged edge. Beat, dog tired. I saw tonight's game. I made some mental reservations about it. You gonna set yourself up as a basketball expert? I know the game, Chris. I was a player as a youngster and a fan ever since. All right, mastermind, go ahead. What did you find suspicious about tonight's game? Well, one thing, the money riding on it. How would you know? Faces in the crowd. Tony Capron, a big Eastern bookmaker. Vince Varden, a notorious fixer of prize fights and horse racing. Varden's been convicted for both. And then uh, Johnny Minton, one I admire, Richie Silk, uh, Bozo the Bull. Oh, you had a prize gallery of fans in the Coliseum tonight. Is that the team's fault? All right. I won't hold the gambling picture as I read it against the team. But uh, answer me this. Why did you replace yourself in the last quarter? A sprained ankle. I'd begun to limp. Ankle looks fine to me now. It wasn't then. Second string player subbing for you meant money in the bank for the gamblers, Chris. You're Blankhurst's anchor man, and it's top scorer. Are you accusing me of deliberately... I wouldn't accuse any boy of anything. Not until I have positive proof. Absolute evidence. You've got a big future ahead, and I'd hate to see it wrecked by stigma or innuendo. I'm a cop, but I worry about that. Thanks for some kind words. Okay. Go keep that hot date, Buster. <laughs> Coach Sandy Biglow was even less cooperative, let alone friendly, than his team captain. I don't take kindly to private snoops annoying my players. Well, don't complain to me. Dean Palmer exceeded his powers in hiring you. I'm going before the board of trustees. Meanwhile, let's talk. I deny every rumor. I've got a bunch of fine kids. Straight as a die. Every mother's son of them. I picked up this morning's paper on the way over. A columnist named Soapy Slater gets off a few remarks. Soapy Slater? Why, the man's an irresponsible muckraker. They load down on sports. Let me read you a few lines. Last night's only blank curse to Van Versen winner was a betting combine. Wonder who Coach Bigelow really obliged in surprise benching of star forward Wisnowski. Tyranny by innuendo. But uh, I'm thick-skinned, Craig. In 20 years of coaching, I've developed a rhinoceros hide. I pay no attention to a columnist. Well, why did you bench Wisnowski? He's a show-off. He's in the race for highest scoring honors in the national basketball. And all he thought about was swelling his total. Also, he was playing to his girl in the stands. She'd flown in from Dubuque to see her hero in action. You understand my benching him now? Yes, I do. I want to ask you some blunt questions, Coach. Fire away. Do you suspect any of your players of dumping? Not the one. As far as you know... Uh, has any player or players suddenly taken on a prosperous look like uh, free spending, clothes, girls, convertibles? There's been absolutely nothing like that. Well, do you have any other blunt questions? Yeah, a hard one to ask. you probably take a punch at me. Yeah, I know the question you intend asking. Am I crooked? Am I dumping games by cleverly mishandling my team? Am I getting a payoff somewhere? I have heard it whispered. Oh, well, Why? You hear it whispered wherever basketball is played these days. Because one or two crooked teams have been exposed, the rest of us bear the brunt. We have to pay for our innocence. Then, for the record, you denounce the rumors around about you. You're tempting me to throw that punch. Sunday in a college town is a day of cemetery quiet. 
I checked into the nearest uh, recreation lounge. The joint was the annex to a hotel, the Hotel Olympia. I had a key to room 222. The bartender, drink, please. You decide what. I want to be surprised. I was halfway through a drink advertised as campus conniption, 99 cents, when a gent came close enough to breathe on me. He looked more of a stranger in town than me. Beefy jowls, a stick pin with a diamond the size of a walnut, and yellow shoes. His kisser was not unfamiliar. Hello, Craig. Place of face? Yes, yes. I didn't know the circus was in town. <laughs> the New York joke's out of place here. So are you, Smiley. I got a sister living here in town. I'm visiting. Why? Well, sit down. I'll tell you why. Okay. I'm tingling with expectancy. Yeah, you'll be tingling all right. When you see what I got for you. Here. For your old age. Well, what's inside the brown wrapping? A grand in 20s. For me? For you. For what? For nothing. And I got something else for you. Let me see. Yeah. Here in my vest pocket. For you, Craig, my compliments. A railroad ticket. One way. Clear to Times Square. <laughs> Wouldn't look at you at the bar. I knew you were homesick. Your train's in an hour. Give my regards to Broadway. Very sorry, Smiley. You're gonna be foolish? I am. The boys and me are making a buck. What's it to you? Nothing. That's a job for the authority. I'm here to crack down on fixing and fixes. Stop the corruption of a basketball squad. And you're here for nothing, Craig. There's nothing to it. No fix, no bribing players. You expect me to believe that? Uh, sounds corny to say, I know. But we haven't been able to reach a player. We try, but no dice. Then uh, why try so hard to ship me home? We're running lucky. We don't want a jinx. So the boys made up a pool. One grand. Get rid of you. They don't want no evil eye. If you don't grab the G, you're a sap. Put it back in your pocket, Smiley. Morning begins early in Hick Towns. I've been in bed seven hours, eyes wide open. Hotel rooms have that effect on me. I mean, flowered wallpaper has. Uh, state who you are. This is Soapy Slater of the Herald Gazette. Good morning. It will be in two hours. Rise and shine. It's seven o'clock. Oh, do I hate cheerful early rises. Uh, Mr. Craig, uh, can I see you? Why? Something pertinent to your work on behalf of Dean Palmer. Oh. In an hour, say? Well, since I'm now doomed to stay awake. At your hotel, then, I'll join you at the breakfast table. Good enough. <laughs> Soapy Slater really did have vital confidential information. Coffee's good. Now, at least three games were dumped by Blankhurst U. Well, give me concrete proof. I've got another kind of proof. Uh, guesswork's no good, Slater. Let's not be callous about the reputations and futures of a lot of young men. Oh, I respect your sensitivity there. I hate to see any young man stigmatized, but suppose my criminal information doesn't concern any of the young men. None of the players? No player. Just the coach. Sandy Bigelow? Sandy Bigelow, yes. Now, if you'll listen... Shoot. I'm a newspaper man. I have sources of information. Now, get down to it. What information did you receive about Sandy Bigelow? That he was seen consorted with gamblers in an out-of-the-way roadhouse called the Blue Lantern, run by Gussie Daniels. Now, drive out and talk to Gussie, why don't you? You'll find a very frank and cooperative... What else against Sandy Bigelow? I have information that Bigelow made a substantial cash deposit in his bank account. The Craig Moore Savings Bank. That's a bank in another county, mind you. A fact significant in itself. Who could tip you to the status of Bigelow's bank account? I'm going to be evasive about that, Craig. Uh, somebody connected with the bank, huh? An official or a teller. <laughs> I'm not answering that. Now, why are you giving me these facts against Sandy Bigelow? To expedite your investigation. To hurry Bigelow into jail. To accomplish that, yes. Why not use the facts yourself for an expose feature? You're a newspaper man. I tried to. My paper refused to use it. I'll write the story from the police blotter when you file arrest charges against Bigelow. In the Cragmore Savings Bank, 70 miles across the county line... I persuaded a bank manager to give me a detailed memorandum on Bigelow's savings account. Persuading the bank manager meant unraveling a lot of red tape. 
satisfying bank policy and protocol, but I got what I was after. My next stop was the Blue Lantern. The owner, Gussie Daniels, was the Amazon type who could lick her weight in men, and probably did, from the looks of her patrons. Her answers were frank and cooperative. He was in here all right, that Bigelow. Over in that corner there, trying not to look conspicuous. Bigelow was in here frequenting with gamblers. Nose to nose, talking to him over beer and pretzels. Can you identify particular gamblers you saw Bigelow with? All that New York crowd. I had a state cop name a few for me. One named Johnny Minton. Oh, mean looker. Another named Richie Silk. <laughs> Crazy about my cheese mix and potato chips, that one. And a third with a funny name that sounds like Bongo or something. Bozo the Bull? Yeah, that's it. Had a bad stomach. Never ate or drank anything in here. Bozo the Bull served time last year for fixing a Midwest basketball game. Well, he's right here up to his fixing tricks. And Bigelow's in with him. Uh, how often would you say Bigelow was in here? Well, it was twice that I've seen him. And there are nights when I'm not here. That's Wednesday and Friday when I'm babysitting from a married daughter. Uh, Ada May, that's my daughter. I'm a grandmother. Oh, great. Buy a drink, Gussie? Sure you can. Buttermilk. <laughs> Before making a cause celeb of the coach, I had a talk with him. Circumstances could be damning on their face, yet untrue. I've been a cop too long not to know that. Bigelow tried explaining his meetings with known gamblers. I've nothing to be ashamed of. I sought those certain gentry out in order to warn them. Warn them of what? To keep away from my boys. You see, there'd been anonymous phone calls to Wisnowski and to Chris Ransom. Open hints of offered bribes. And both Wisnowski and Ransom reported the incidents to me. I told them to say nothing. So you met with the gamblers discreetly to tell them off? I threatened them with police action if they ever bothered my boys again. Well, you believe me, Craig? Frankly, I'm not sure I do. Why do you bank 70 miles away in Cragmore? Well, habit. I used to coach Cragmore College back in 1950, five years ago. I never canceled or transferred my bank account, that's all. What's your balance there now? My balance? Well, it's about uh, $1,200, I'd say. Why? Got your bank book handy? Why, no. In fact, I don't have it at all. It's been missing for months. It's mislaid or lost. Or... I see. Suppose I told you that your balance is more like a... Uh... Wait, I have a bank memorandum on it with me. Here, have a look. You're up to $6,000, Bigelow. Six thousand. Uh... Well, that's impossible. Fat deposits made periodically since the start of the basketball season. Well, what's your answer? Craig, somebody's out to incriminate me. Smear me, a frame-up. I haven't made a deposit in my Cragmore account in almost a year. Now, you're not really asking me to believe a trick was worked on you where, say, your bank book was stolen so that sneak deposits could be made swelling your savings account. Well, if that slip you showed me is actually so... Yes. I am asking you to believe exactly that. Character assassination through framework. I postponed judgment on Coach Bigelow for the time being. And pretty soon, events justified my discretion there. The team captain, Chris Ransom, had again been contacted by the gambling mob. And this time, Bigelow brought his boy to me. A man named Smiley. He smoked me in Leary's drugstore. How much did he offer you? $5,000. To be divided between myself and one other player I could recruit. He suggested I talk to Wisnowski. Which game does the mob want dumped? The last one on our schedule. Against Barnaby Tech. Oh, Bigelow. Yes, Craig? How does Blankhurst you compare with Barnaby Tech? Well, we've beaten them three years running. By margins of 20 points or more. Meaning Blankhurst, you should enter the game and odds on favor. Oh, I should say so, yes. The mob wants to bet Barnaby Tech heavy and make a final killing. Okay. We'll accept the bribe. Accept? Now, you wait a minute, Mr. Craig. To teach the mob a better lesson. Where it hurts most in the pocketbook. You will accept the bribe, Ransom. Promise to dump the game along with Wisnowski. And then play your fool heads off. 
Trim Barnaby Tech from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> The game against Barnaby was played as scheduled. Kuznowski and Chris Ransom played the best ball of that or any other year. They scored almost at will. At the final whistle, the score was 76 to 38, favoring Blankhurst. I'd never seen a more shattered bunch than that gambling clique. <laughs> they looked as if the specter of the breadline haunted them. The Blankhurst team got a rising ovation. I was in the offices of the Herald Gazette the following a.m. I read Soapy Slater's column back to me. Question. Was there reverse dumping in last night's Blankhurst-Barnaby game? Why the sudden life to Wisnowski and Ransom? Was it that certain elements required a better than 20-point spread in order to cash in? I'm only asking. Well, Slater. Well, what? Why the awful lie? Is it a lie? Malicious, deliberate, cowardly. I happen to know this time. Uh Wisnowski and Ransom deliberately cheated cheaters last night. They took bribe money on my say-so, agreed to dump so far as the gamblers were concerned, but instead played to win. Why are you so passionately anxious to smear? I... I've got nothing to say. Then answer this. Why have you been plotting to destroy Coach Bigelow? Destroy him by frame-up. Bigelow. Bigelow rates everything I can dish out to him. That man isn't human. Then there's a personal motive against Bigelow. What, Slater? Go on, talk. Bigelow is a paragon of virtue. Thinks of himself as a god. He sees life as a blackboard maxim. You're either very good or very bad. No shadings in between. If you're very good, he loves and adores you. If you're bad or weak or just a fool, Big Low will crucify you. No mercy, no quarter, no... no human understanding. Who was it so close to you that Big Low crucified? My son, Bob. Bob played for Crabmore College once, eight years ago, when Big Low coached there. Bob made a slip. Your son took a bribe. Yeah. But he didn't go through with his bargain. My son did not dump. But Bigelow never took that into consideration. The fact that my son wrestled with his conscience and won, Bigelow didn't care to hear. He drummed my son out of college basketball. Your son was Bob Slater. Bob Quonset. We changed our name to Slater. There is a meeting today in Dean Palmer's office. Team, Bigelow... The college trustees, me. You be there too, Slater. We'll get all the truth there, out in the open. There's a kind of catharsis for everybody. When we're done, we let the police study the minutes of our meeting, decide what action they want to take. You come, huh, Slater? Get it off your chest. <laughs> You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Sucker Bait, was written by John Robert. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator, directed by Andrew C. Love. Our cast included Norman Field, Jess Kirkpatrick, John Stevenson, Joe Forte, and Gloria Ann Simpson. Monitor takes you everywhere this Sunday on NBC Radio.